Hello everyone, my name is Jacob Pred, um, and welcome back to Something Sinister, where we explore the horror in fact and in fiction. I actually just got done recording the intro to the previous upload where I talk about a horror film that I'm trying to get made. Um, go check it out if you're interested, but if, if you're wondering why I'm wearing the same shirt, which you're probably not, but that's why. <laughs> so today's topic is the Catholic controversy and conspiracy iceberg. Now this is an iceberg that I did not make myself, and uh, so given that, I will leave a link down to the original down in the description below. Um, this iceberg is one of the most detailed and overall well, it's just one of the well-made icebergs that I've ever seen before. But given that, the iceberg itself, it's so, it's so, um, dense and so well covered that to make a video detailing uh, it in its entirety would require like um, like three hours. It would be a three hour long video. So essentially what I did is sort of uh, break it down and make it a little bit more palatable because um, for those of you who don't know, and I didn't know prior to going into this, um, Catholicism as a whole is, is extremely uh, complex, full of, of history, and you have to, you have to know a lot to, to fully uh, understand all of it. So what I did with with this video, um, I hand hand selected some of the more uh, prominent categories to talk about. So each of the items listed in that original iceberg, not all of them are featured. Um, like I said, I tried to go with with ones that are a little bit more. Uh, I guess digestible, so to speak. That way you don't have to have a really extensive knowledge on Catholicism as a whole to sort of uh, listen to the video and, and gain an understanding of it. As always, there will be uh, chapter breaks down below, so if you want to skip to a, a certain tier, you're more than welcome to do so. And another really important thing that I would like to uh, throw out there before we get into the video, um, this, this video and this iceberg is very critical um, of Catholicism and that religion as a whole. Um, for me personally, I'm a very firm believer um, that uh, I'm a believer in freedom of religion and that uh, anyone has the right to, to worship whatever God they, they choose and so desire. So while this, while this video is critical of the religion, I don't want to come off as condemning or saying that if you partake in this religion, you are a bad person because I do not believe that. But with all that being said, um, thank you guys so much uh, as always for checking out the videos and stopping by and um, I will... Talk to you shortly. There have been many cases of sexual abuse of children by Catholic priests, nuns, popes, and other members of religious life. In the 20th and 21st centuries, the cases have involved many allegations, investigations, trials, convictions, acknowledgement and apologies by church authorities, and revelations about decades of instances of abuse and attempts by church officials to cover them up. The abused include mostly boys but also girls, some as young as 3 years old, with the majority between the ages of 11 and 14. Criminal cases, for the most part, do not cover sexual harassment of adults. The accusations of abuse and cover-ups began to receive public attention during the late 1980s. Many of these cases allege decades of abuse, frequently made by adults or older youths years after the abuse occurred. Cases have also been brought against members of the Catholic hierarchy who covered up sex abuse allegations and moved abusive priests to other parishes where abuse continued. Mother Teresa is a prominent Catholic nun and the founder of the Missionaries of Charity. This organization has undergone much scrutiny by the media, including objections to the quality of medical care which they provided, suggestions that some deathbed baptisms constituted forced conversion, and alleged links to colonialism and racism, and relations to questionable public figures. The controversy extends to include the large sums of money donated to her as well as the Vatican for ignoring the criticisms raised by said media and people. The Crusades were a series of religious wars initiated, supported, and sometimes directed by the Latin Church in the medieval period. 
The best known of these crusades are those to the Holy Land in the period between 1095 and 1291 that were intended to recover Jerusalem and its surrounding area from Islamic rule. Beginning with the First Crusade, which resulted in the recovery of Jerusalem in 1099, dozens of crusades were fought, providing a focal point of European history for centuries. The First Crusades had a variety of motivations, including religious salvation, satisfying fugual obligations, opportunities for renown, and economic or political advantage. Later crusades were conducted by generally more organized armies, sometimes led by a king. The Spanish Inquisition was established in 1478 and was intended to maintain Catholic orthodoxy in their kingdoms and to replace the medieval Inquisition. The Spanish Inquisition may be defined broadly as operating in Spain and in all Spanish colonies and territories, which included the Canary Islands, the Kingdom of Naples, and all Spanish possessions in North, Central, and South America. According to modern estimates, around 100 150,000 people were prosecuted for various offenses during the three-century duration of the Spanish Inquisition, of whom between 3,000 and 5,000 were executed. The Inquisition was originally intended primarily to identify heretics among those who converted from Judaism and Islam to Catholicism. The Inquisition is infamous for the severity of its tortures and its persecution of Jews and Muslims. If you are unfamiliar, a heretic or heresy involves going against the dominant belief or main ideas of a church or religious organization. The first recorded case of heretics being burnt in Western Europe in the Middle Ages occurred in 1022. Civil authorities burned persons judged to be heretics under the medieval Inquisition. Burning heretics had become a customary practice in the latter half of the 12th century in continental Europe, and death by burning became statutory punishment from the early 13th century. Death by burning for heretics was made positive law by Pedro II of Aragon in 1197. In 1224, Frederick II made burning a legal alternative, and in 1238, it became the principal punishment in the empire. In Sicily, the punishment was made law in 1231, whereas in France, it was made binding law in 1270. The official teachings of Pope John Paul II in 1992 oppose all forms of abortion procedures whose direct purpose is to destroy a zygote, blastocyst, embryo, or fetus, since it holds that human life must be respected and protected absolutely from the moment of conception. From the first moment of his existence, a human being must be recognized as having the rights of a person, among which is the inherent right of every innocent being to life. However, the church does recognize as morally legitimate certain acts which indirectly result in the deaths of a fetus as when the direct purpose is removal of a cancerous womb. Clerical celibacy is the requirement in certain religions that some or all members of the clergy be unmarried. Clerical celibacy also requires abstention from deliberately indulging in sexual thoughts and behavior outside of marriage because these impulses are regarded as sinful. Many people attribute this act as a part of the ongoing sexual abuse in Catholicism. The Catholic Church has intervened in political discourses to enact legislative and constitutional provisions establishing marriage as the union of a man and a woman, resisting efforts by civil governments to establish either civil unions or same-sex marriage. Pope Francis is the first pope to support same-sex civil unions, saying that same-sex civil unions are good and helpful to many. The Church has been opposed to contraception for as far back as one can historically trace. Many early Catholic Church Fathers made statements condemning the use of contraception. Among the condemnations is one which refers to an apparent oral form of contraception. Quote, Some go as far as to take potions, that they may ensure bareness, and thus murder human beings almost before their conception. 
The Catechism specifies that all marriage acts must be both unitive and procreative. In addition to condemning the use of artificial birth control as intrinsically evil, non-procreative sex acts as mutual masturbation and anal sex are all ruled out as ways to avoid pregnancy. Because the church opposes deliberately destroying innocent human life at any stage, for research or any other purpose, it opposes embryonic stem cell research as currently conducted. Catholics believe that euthanasia is a crime against life. The teaching of the Catholic Church on euthanasia rests on several core principles of Catholic ethics, including the sanctity of human life, the dignity of the human person, human rights due to proportionality in causistic remedies, the inevitability of death, and the importance of charity. Very similar to the views of homosexuality, the Catholic Church largely recognizes two biological sexes, those being male and female. The United States Conference of Catholic Bishops has not issued an official policy regarding the Equality Act, a comprehensive bill that would, if passed, add sexual orientation and gender identity to the federal civil rights protections that already exist based on race, color, religion, sex, and national origin. In Canada, the Indian residential school system was a network of boarding schools for indigenous peoples. The network was funded by Canadian government's Department of Indian Affairs and administrated by Christian churches. The school system was created to isolate indigenous children from the influence of their own native culture and religion in an effort to assimilate them into the dominant Canadian culture. Over the course of the system's more than a hundred year existence, around 150,000 and children were placed in residential schools nationally. The residential school system harmed indigenous children significantly by removing them from their families, depriving them of their ancestral languages, and exposing many of them to physical and sexual abuse. Conditions in the schools led to student malnutrition, starvation, and disease. Students were also subjected to forced assimilation, which essentially removed their legal identity as Indians. Disconnected from their families and culture and forced to speak English or French, Students often graduated being unable to fit into their communities but remaining subject to racist attitudes in mainstream Canadian society. The system ultimately proved successful in disrupting the transmission of indigenous practices and beliefs across generations. The legacy of the system has also been linked to an increase in prevalence of post-traumatic stress, alcoholism, substance abuse, suicide, and intergenerational trauma which persist within indigenous communities today. The Magdalene Laundries in Ireland, also known as Magdalene Asylums, were institutions usually run by Roman Catholic orders, which operated from the 18th to late 20th centuries. They were run ostensibly to house fallen women, an estimated 30,000 of whom were confined in these institutions in Ireland. The term fallen women primarily referred to prostitutes, but by the end of the 19th century, Magdalene laundries were filled with many different kinds of women, including girls who were not prostitutes at all, but either seduced women or women who had yet to engage in sexual activity at all. In 1993, unmarked graves of 155 women were uncovered in the grounds of one of the laundries. Though not initially reported, this eventually triggered a public scandal, bringing unprecedented attention to the secretive institutions. In 1999, former asylum inmates Mary Norris, Josephine McCarthy, and Mary Jo McDonagh gave accounts of their treatment. The 1997 Channel 4 documentary Sex in a Cold Climate interviewed former inmates of Magdalene Asylums who testified to continued sexual, psychological, and physical abuse while being isolated from the outside world for an indefinite amount of time. 
Allegations about the conditions in the convents and the treatment of the inmates were made into the 2002 film titled The Magdalene Sisters, written and directed by Peter Mullen. Since 2001, the Irish government has acknowledged that women in the Magdalene laundries were victims of abuse. However, the Irish government has resisted calls for investigation and proposals for compensation. It maintains that the laundries were privately run and abuses at the laundries were outside of the government's remit. In contrast to these claims, evidence exists that Irish courts routinely send women convicted of petty crimes to the laundries. The government awarded lucrative contracts to the laundries without any insistence on protection and fair treatment of their workers. And Irish state employees helped keep laundry facilities stocked with workers by bringing women to work there and returning escaped workers. A formal state apology was issued in 2013 and compensation was offered to survivors, which was set up by the Irish government. Hitler's Pope was a book published in 1999 by the British journalist and author John Cornwell that examines the actions of Eugenio Pacelli, who became Pope Pius XII before and during the Nazi era, and explores the charge that he assisted in the legitimization of Adolf Hitler's Nazi regime in Germany. The book is critical of Pius's conduct during the Second World War, arguing that he did not do enough or speak out enough against the Holocaust. Cornwell argues that Pius's entire career as the nuncio to Germany, Cardinal Secretary of State, and Pope was characterized by a desire to increase and centralize the power of the papacy, and that he subordinated opposition to the Nazis to that goal. He further argues that Pius was anti-Semitic and that his stance prevented him from caring about European Jews. There is a traditionally Catholic idea that we as humans will not meet our pets when we go to heaven, and that they will cease to exist after their time here on earth. According to St. Thomas Aquinas, who was the Italian priest and influential philosopher, being incapable of moral acts means animals can't sin, which means that they don't need a savior, which is good because they're sensitive as opposed to rational. Souls do not survive the death of their bodies, having no further or higher end to achieve. So to sum it up, much as humans may appreciate their being around and project onto them human qualities, animals can neither merit nor enjoy eternal life after death. They don't deserve a reward or indeed require one. For obvious reasons, this is upsetting to many people, religious or otherwise, and has once again tainted the way that people view Catholicism. The religious beliefs of Adolf Hitler, dictator of Nazi Germany from 1933 to 1945, have been a matter of debate. His opinions regarding religious matters changed considerably over time. During the beginning of his political life, Hitler publicly expressed favorable opinions towards Christianity. Some historians describe his later posture as being anti-Christian. He also criticized atheism. Hitler was born to a practicing Catholic mother and was baptized in the Roman Catholic Church. His father, however, was a free thinker and skeptical of the church. In 1904, he was confirmed at the Roman Catholic Cathedral in Linz, Austria, where his family lived. According to John Willard Toland, witnesses indicate that Hitler's confirmation sponsor had to drag the words out of him, almost as though the whole confirmation was repugnant to him. Hitler biographer John Toland offers the opinion that Hitler carried within him its teaching that the Jew was the killer of God. The extermination, therefore, could be done without a twinge of conscience since he was merely acting as the avenging hand of God. Rissman notes that, according to several witnesses who lived with Hitler in the men's home in Vienna, he never again attended Mass or received the sacraments after leaving home at 18 years old. Krieger claims that Hitler abandoned the Catholic Church, while Hitler's last secretary asserted that he was not a member of any church at all. Otto Strasser stated critically of the dictator, Hitler is in fact an atheist for his unsettling sympathy to Rosenberg's paganism. Another general who 
who worked closely with Hitler also said that he had once stated, I am now as before a Catholic and will always remain so. In a speech in the early years of his rule, Hitler declared himself not a Catholic but a German Christian. The German Christians were a Protestant group that supported Nazi ideology. Hitler and the Nazi party also promoted non-denominational positive Christianity, a movement which rejected the most traditional Christian doctrines such as the divinity of Jesus, as well as Jewish elements such as the Old Testament. In one widely quoted remark, he described Jesus as an Aryan fighter who struggled against the power and pretensions of the corrupt Pharisees and Jewish materialism. Hitler's regime launched an effort toward coordination of German Protestants into a joint Protestant Reich Church and moved early to eliminate political Catholicism. Several historians have insisted that Hitler and his inner circle were influenced by other religions. In a eulogy for a friend, Hitler called on him to enter Valhalla, but he later stated that it would be foolish to re-establish the worship of Odin within Germanic paganism. Some historians argue that he was prepared to delay conflicts for political reasons and that his intentions were to eventually eliminate Christianity in Germany altogether, or at least to reform it to suit a Nazi outlook. Because the Catholic Church opposes abortion as a matter of doctrine, some Catholic bishops have refused or threatened to refuse communion or threatened to declare excommunication upon Catholic politicians who support abortion rights. In 2004, there was a discussion of whether communion should be refused to American Catholic politicians who voted against laws banning abortion. With a few American bishops in favor of withholding communion from politicians and the majority against, the United States Conference of Catholic Bishops decided that such matters should be decided on a case-by-case -case basis by the individual bishops. Globally, the decisions regarding this matter all have different outcomes, but in the United States many politicians have been threatened with refusal of communion, including President Joe Biden. Proposals to deny communion to pro-abortion rights politicians are more common in the United States. While there is disagreement among the bishops about the opportunities of refusing the Eucharist to Catholic politicians promoting legalization of abortion, there has been unanimity regarding the moral obligation of the Catholic politicians who participate in what their church considers a seriously sinful action to refrain from going to communion, an obligation stated on several occasions. Papal infallibility is a dogma of the Catholic Church which states that, in virtue of the promise of Jesus to Peter, the Pope when he speaks ex cathedra is preserved from the possibility of error on the doctrine, initially given to the apostolistic church and handed down in scripture and in tradition. It does not mean, however, that the Pope cannot sin. This doctrine defined dogmatically at the First Vatican Council of 1869-1870 and the document Pastor Aeternus is claimed to have existed in medieval theology and to have been the majority opinion at the time of the Counter-Reformation. George Henry Joseph was a Belgian Catholic priest, theoretical physicist, mathematician, astronomer, and professor of physics at the Catholic University of Louvain. He was the first to theorize that the recession of nearby galaxies can be explained by the expanding universe, which was observationally confirmed soon afterwards by Edwin Hubble. He first derived Hubble's law and published the first estimation of the Hubble constant in 1927, two years before Hubble's article. In 1931, George was invited to London to participate in a meeting of the British Association on the relation between physical universe and spirituality. There he proposed that the universe expanded from an initial point, which he called the primeval atom. He developed this idea in a report published in Nature and later called it the beginning of the world. George's theory appeared for the first time in an article for the general reader on science and technology subjects in the December 1932 issue of Popular Science. George's theory became better known as the Big Bang Theory, a picturesque term playfully coined during the 1949 BBC radio broadcast by astronomer Fred Hoyle, who was a proponent of the steady-state universe and remained so until his death in 2001. 
Purgatory is, according to the belief of some Christian denominations, mostly Catholic, is an intermediate state after physical death. The process of purgatory is the final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. Traditionally, by reference to certain texts of scripture, sees the process as involving a cleansing in fire. Some forms of Western Christianity, particularly within Protestantism, deny its existence entirely. Other strands of Western Christianity see purgatory as a place, perhaps filled with fire. The Catholic Church holds that all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified, undergo a process of purification, which the Church calls purgatory, so as to achieve the holiness necessary to enter the joy of heaven. The Catholic Church gives the name purgatory to what it calls the after-death purification of all who die in God's grace and friendship, but still imperfectly purified. Though in popular imagination, purgatory is pictured as a place rather than a process of purification, the idea of purgatory as a physical place with time is not part of the Church's doctrine. Fire, another important element of purgatory of popular imagination, is also absent in the Catholic Church's doctrine. The Galileo Affair began around 1610 and culminated with the trial and condemnation of Galileo Galilee by the Roman Catholic Inquisition in 1633. Galileo was persecuted for his support of heliocentrism, an astronomical model in which the Earth and planets revolve around the Sun at the center of the universe. In 1610, Galileo published Starry Messenger, describing the observations that he had made with his new, much stronger telescope, amongst them the Galilean moons of Jupiter. With these observations and additional observations that followed, such as the phases of Venus, he promoted the heliocentric theory of Nicholas Copernicus. Galileo's discoveries were met with opposition within the Catholic Church, and in 1616, the Inquisition declared heliocentrism to be a form of heresy. Galileo went on to propose a theory that the tides were evidence of motion on Earth. In 1632, Galileo published his Dialogue Concerning the Two Chief World Systems, which defended heliocentrism and was immensely popular. Responding to mounting controversy over theology, astronomy, and philosophy, the Roman Inquisition tried Galileo in 1633 and found him suspect of heresy, and sentenced him to house arrest where he remained until his death in 1642. At that point, heliocentric books were banned and Galileo was ordered to abstain from holding, teaching, or defending heliocentric ideas after the trial. The affair was complex since very early on, Pope Urban VIII had been a patron to Galileo and had given him permission to publish the theory as long as he treated it as a hypothesis. But after the publication in 1632, the patronage was broken off due to numerous reasons. Historians of science have corrected numerous false interpretations of the affair. The Da Vinci Code, a popular suspense novel by Dan Brown, generated criticism and controversy after its publication in 2003. Many of the complaints centered on the book's speculations and misrepresentations of core aspects of Christianity and the history of the Catholic Church. Additional criticisms were directed towards the book's inaccurate descriptions of European art, history, architecture, and geography. On April 11, 2005, novelist Louis Perdue sued Brown and his publisher, Random House, for plagiarizing his novels The Da Vinci Legacy in 1983 and Daughter of God in 1999, claiming that there are far too many parallels between my books and The Da Vinci Code for it to be an accident. On August 4, 2005, District Judge George B. Daniels granted a motion for summary judgment and dismissed the suit, ruling that a reasonable average lay observer would not conclude that the Da Vinci Code is substantially similar to Daughter of God. These slightly similar elements are on the level of generalized or otherwise unprotected ideas. He affirmed that the Da Vinci Code does not infringe upon copyrights held by Purdue. This is just one of the multiple copyright infringements infringement lawsuits that have been brought alleging plagiarism in the Da Vinci Code. (laughs) 
Opus Dei is a personal prelature within the Roman Catholic Church that has been the subject of numerous controversies. Throughout its history, Opus Dei has been criticized by many, including by numerous members who knew the founder and had roles in Opus Dei's internal government. Journalists have described it as the most controversial force in the Catholic Church, and its founder as a polarizing figure. Controversies about Opus Dei have centered on allegations of secretiveness, but also on sexual abuse cases in Spain, Mexico, Uruguay, Chile, and the United States. Cases that were investigated and canonical sanctions were applied to the perpetrators. Controversies have to do with recruiting methods aimed at teenagers becoming numeraries, the illicit use of psychiatric drugs in its central headquarters, the misleading of its lay faithful about their status and rights under canon law, the mortification of flesh practiced by its celibate members, elitism and misogyny, and support of authoritarian or right-wing governments, including the reactionary Franco regime. Jesuit conspiracy theories are conspiracy theories about the members of the Society of Jesus, or Jesuits, a religious order in the Catholic Church. Such theories began appearing as early or late as 1550, just ten years after the founding of the Jesuits, and were often purported by their enemies due to the intellectual and political influence which members of the Society of Jesus exerted. Other conspiracy theories and criticisms relate to the role of Jesuits in the colonization of the New World and their involvement with indigenous peoples. Some allege that the Jesuits, through their settlements, may willingly have contributed to the assimilation of indigenous nations, even accusing the society of commanding them in guerrilla warfare. On the other hand, the Jesuits were hated by the Catholic rulers and colonists who saw their reductions, which were cut off from contact with European Christians, as subversive and a threat to the good order, at times even believing in the worst of accusations against the society. The Great Apostasy is a concept within Christianity to describe a perception that mainstream Christian churches have fallen away from the original faith founded by Jesus and publicized through his twelve apostles. A belief in a great apostasy has been characteristic of restorationist tradition of Christianity, which includes unrelated restorationist groups emerging after the Second Great Awakening, such as the Latter-day Saints and Jehovah's Witnesses. These restorationist groups hold the traditional Christianity, represented by Catholicism, Protestantism, and Orthodoxy, have all fallen in error, and thus the true faith needs to be restored. Christianity's greatest miracle is the transubstantiation of the Eucharist that happens daily all over the world. This central dogma of the Catholic faith boldly claims that, despite retaining all the physical characteristics of bread and wine, these food staples, once consecrated, truly become the actual flesh and blood of the Son of God during the sacrifice of the Mass. Many people have ignored this great event, saying that the bread and wine are mere symbols and that Jesus used them at the Last Supper in an act of commemoration and celebration of community. It would seem like an acceptable and comfortable interpretation of Jesus' intention and ease this strange notion of required cannibalism, but to see that this interpretation is incorrect, one must look no further than the Gospel of John to the scandal that Jesus caused with his command. So Jesus said to them, Truly, truly, I say to you, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. He who eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. Marian apparitions is a phenomenon in which witnesses claim that the Virgin Mary, or Jesus' mother, appears to them as a ghost-like apparition. The earliest known claim was from St. James the Greater, who saw the Virgin Mary while he was preaching on the banks in Spain in 40 AD. Today, apparition reports occur much more frequently. More on this topic throughout the video. 
In two parts of the Divine Comedy, Dante imagines various levels of hell and heaven. He describes the inferno in great detail, vividly describing the torments and agonies of hell. These descriptions, however, do not come from the Bible. Some come from Islamic tradition. The Quranic basics for this account in Quran 17.1 and Muslims commemorate annually the Night of Ascension or the seventh month on the Islamic calendar. It is assumed that the general plots as well as many of the small details of Dante's Divine Comedy reflect a fantastic treatment of the Islamic theme. Some have speculated, however, perhaps the terrible images of the Inferno spring from Dante's doubt about his own salvation. Catholics, for the most part, have shown their commitment to life on this issue. A recent PPRI poll found that 80% of Catholics support vaccination, with only 7% defined as vaccine refusers. In fact, Catholics appear to be ahead of most of their faith traditions in stepping up, being pro-life, and protecting the common good. Catholic hospitals and universities, likewise, are witnessing the Church's commitments to life, healing, and the common good by requiring that employees and students who wish to return to offices and campuses and participate in the goods of common life be vaccinated. Educational institutions and some professional bodies have had vaccine requirements for decades, and the Church has never opposed them. Yet, in contradiction to the authoritative guidance repeatedly provided by Pope Francis, the Holy See, and the U.S. Conference of Catholic Bishops, that all COVID-19 vaccines are morally acceptable and that Catholics have a duty, responsibility, or obligation to be vaccinated. Some Catholics, however, continue to voice and suggest that vaccines might somehow be morally compromised and are actively supporting Catholics in requesting religious exemptions from vaccine requirements on the basis of Catholic teaching on the primacy of conscience. One organization even crafted a religious exemption template letter that has been promoted by a small number of bishops, advertised in parish bulletins, and distributed through social media networks. This position not only distorts Catholic teaching on conscious, but it also ignores most of the necessary components of Catholic moral discernment, our liturgical identity, charity, and the virtues, the consensus position of magisterial authority, Catholic social teaching, and even principles of Catholic bioethics. Prisoner in the Vatican described the situation of the Pope with respect to Italy during the period from the capture of Rome by armed forces of the Kingdom of Italy on the 20th of September 1870 until the Lateran Treaty on the 11th of February 1929. Part of the process of Italian unification, the city's capture ended the millennium-old temporal rule of popes over central Italy and allowed Rome to be the designated capital of the new nation. Although the Italians did not occupy the territories of Vatican Hill, delimited by the Lenonan walls, and offered the creation of the city-state in the area, the popes from Pius IX to Pius XI refused the proposal and described themselves as prisoners of the new Italian state. Spanish for Our Lady of Holy Death, often shortened to simply Santa Muerte, is a cult image, female deity, and folk saint in folk Catholicism and Mexican neo-paganism. A personification of death, she is associated with healing, protection, and safe delivery to the afterlife by her devotees. Despite condemnation by leaders of the Catholic Church and more recently evangelical movements, her following has become increasingly prominent since the turn of the 21st century. The following of Santa Muerte began in Mexico sometime in the mid-20th century and became more mainstream in the 1990s. Most prayers and other rites have been traditionally performed privately at home. Since the beginning of the 21st century, however, worship has become more public, especially in Mexico City after a believer called Enriqueta Romero initiated her famous Mexico City Shrine in 2001. The number of believers in Santa Muerte has grown over the past 10 to 20 years to an estimated 10 to 20 million followers in Mexico, parts of Central America, and the United States and Canada. 
In the banquet of the Eucharist, some Catholics believe that Jesus is not dead, but is a living sacrifice. Secondly, his substance is not diminished by consuming the Eucharist. To the contrary, Jesus is bodily in heaven, seated at the right hand of the Father, though his body becomes miraculously present wherever the Eucharist is celebrated. Thirdly, the eating of his body and blood does not result in practical physical nourishment on a natural level, although some have miraculously subsisted solely on the Eucharist. The purpose of the Eucharist is to provide spiritual nourishment. Cannibals consume the flesh of a dead person in a way that diminishes and profanes the corpse. Throughout the sacrament of the Eucharist, Jesus freely gives himself to us, and we consume his living body, blood, soul, and divinity in a way that mysteriously and miraculously does not diminish him, but instead enhances our spiritual life. Critics of this practice, however, may simply call it cannibalism. Pope Joan was, according to legend, a woman who reigned as Pope for two years during the Middle Ages. Her story first appeared in Chronicles in the 13th century and subsequently spread throughout Europe. The story was widely believed for centuries, but most modern scholars regard it as fictional. Most versions of her story describe her as a talented and learned woman who disguised herself as a man, often at the behest of a lover. In the most common accounts, owing to her abilities, she rose through the church hierarchy and eventually was elected as pope. Her sex was revealed when she gave birth during a procession and she died shortly after, either murder or of natural causes. The Black Legend is a theorized historiographical tendency which consists of anti-Spanish and anti-Catholic propaganda. Its proponents argue that its roots dates back to the 16th century, when it originally was a political and psychological weapon that was used by Spain's European rivals in order to demonize the Spanish Empire, its people, and its culture, minimize Spanish discoveries and achievements, and counter its influence and power in world affairs. Like other black legends, the Spanish black legend combined fabrications, decontextualization, exaggeration, cherry-picking, and double standards with facts. Johann Tetzel was a German-Dominican friar and preacher. He was appointed inquisitor for Poland and Saxony, later becoming the Grand Commissioner for Indulgences in Germany. Tetzel was known for granting indulgences on behalf of the Catholic Church in exchange for money, which grants a remission of temporal punishment due to sin, the guilt of which has been forgiven. In other words, Tetzel would offer forgiveness for sins in exchange for money. Pope John Paul I died suddenly in September of 1978, just 33 days after his election. Following contradictory reports about the circumstances of his death and apparent anomalies about the issuing of the death certificate and other procedures, several conspiracy theories have emerged. Most of them state that the Pope had financial scandals involving the Vatican Bank, which could have exposed the financial scandals tied to it involving Freemasons, the Mafia, and significant amounts of money laundering. In 2019, 19 theologians and academics released a letter to all Catholic bishops throughout the world accusing Pope Francis of being a heretic and urging the bishops to take action in order to rectify this dire state of affairs. This was in response to the Pope's continual ambiguity when addressing controversial affairs such as same-sex marriage. However, many Catholic apologists have stated the fact that Pope Francis articulates these positions in an ambiguous manner, which makes it almost impossible to accuse him rightly of heresy. The Catholic Church authorizes the use of exorcism for those who are believed to be the victims of demonic possession. The Catholic Church revised the right of exorcism in January of 1999, though the traditional right of exorcism in Latin is allowed as an option. The ritual assumes that possessed persons retain their free will, though the demon may hold control over their physical body, and involves prayers, blessings, and invocations with the use of the document of exorcisms and certain supplications. 
Stigmata in Roman Catholicism are bodily wounds, scars, and pain which appear in locations corresponding to the crucifixion wounds of Jesus Christ, the hands, wrists, and feet. Stigmata are exclusively associated with Roman Catholicism. Many reported stigmatics are members of Catholic religious orders. Going off of stigmata, the first priest to exhibit the wounds was 20th century mystic Saint Padre Pio, whose scientifically well-documented marks persisted for about 50 years until they healed at the time of his death. Pio was said to have had the gift of reading souls and the ability to bilocate, among other supernatural phenomena. He was also said to communicate with angels and work favors and healings before they were requested of him. Throughout the history of the Catholic Church, there have been reports of supposed miraculous preservations of the corpses of the holy deceased. Many of these bodies were discovered by accident, and others have unearthed during the Catholic rite of recognition in the canonization process. Some of the bodies have been preserved through extraordinary means of embalming and perfect environmental conditions. Other bodies have been waxed over to preserve the features of the formerly incorrupt corpse. The majority of the corpses in question have survived many years, in some cases several centuries, in a perfect state only to inexplicably later decay at a normal rate. Other formerly perfect corpses have browned and dried but still exist in an atypical state. Despite all doubts which arise concerning the veracity of incorruptibility claims, the phenomenon still does not have a satisfactory scientific explanation. Natural Family Planning, or NFP, comprises the family planning methods approved by the Catholic Church and some Protestant denominations for both achieving and postponing or avoiding pregnancy. In accordance with the Church's teachings regarding sexual behavior, NFP excludes the use of other methods of birth control, which it refers to as artificial contraception. Periodic abstinence, the crux of NFP, is deemed moral by the church for avoiding or postponing pregnancy for just reasons. When used to avoid pregnancy, couples may engage in sexual intercourse during a woman's naturally occurring and fertile times, such as during the portions of her ovulatory cycle. Various methods may be used to identify whether a woman is likely to be fertile, this information may be used in attempts to either avoid or achieve pregnancy. Complementarianism is a theological view in Christianity, Judaism, and Islam that men and women have different but complementary roles and responsibilities in marriage, family life, and religious leadership. Some Christians interpret the Bible as prescribing complementarianism and therefore adhere to gender-specific roles that preclude women from specific functions of ministry within the community. Though women may be precluded from certain roles and ministries, they are held to be at an equal in moral value and equal status. Complementarians assign primary leadership roles to men and support roles to women based on their interpretation of certain biblical passages. One of the ideas of complementarianism is that while women may assist in the decision-making process, the ultimate authority for the decision is the purview of the male in the marriage, courtship, and in the idea of the churches subscribing to this view. The main contrasting viewpoint is Christian egalitarianism, which maintains that positions of authority and responsibility in the marriage and religion should be equally available to both male and females. Limbo of infants is the hypothetical permanent status of the unbaptized who die in infancy, too young to have committed actual sins but not having been freed from original sin. Recent Catholic theological speculation tends to stress the hope, although not the certainty, that these infants may attain heaven instead of the state of limbo. Most Roman Catholic priests in hierarchy will now say that no child could ever be condemned for the sins committed by our ancestors, and that they no longer believe that limbo for children exists. The Shroud of Turin is a length of linen cloth bearing the negative image of a man. Some describe the image as depicting Jesus of Nazareth and believe that the fabric is the burial shroud in which he was wrapped after crucifixion. First mentioned in 1354, the shroud was denounced in 1389 by a local bishop of Troyes as a fake. 
Currently, the Catholic Church neither formally endorses nor rejects the Shroud. The Shroud has been kept in the Royal Chapel at the Cathedral of Turin in Northern Italy since 1578. In 1988, radiocarbon dating established that the Shroud was from the Middle Ages, between the years of 1260 and 1390. All hypotheses put forward to challenge the radiocarbon dating have been scientifically refuted, including the medieval repair hypothesis, the biocontamination hypothesis, and the carbon monoxide hypothesis. The Two Babylons is a book that started out as a religious pamphlet published in 1853 by the Presbyterian Free Church of Scotland theologian Alexander Hislop. Its central theme is the argument that the Catholic Church is the Babylon of Apocalypse, which is described in the Bible. The book delves into the symbolism of the image which is described in the book of Revelation, the woman with the golden cup, and it also attempts to prove that many of the fundamental practices of the Church of Rome stem from non-scriptural precedents. It analyzes modern Catholic holidays, including Christmas and Easter, and attempts to trace their roots back to pagan festivals. It also attempts to show that many other accepted doctrines, such as Jesus' crucifixion on the cross, may not be correct. Hislop provides a detailed comparison of the ancient religion which was established in Babylon by drawing on a variety of historical and religious sources in order to show that the modern papacy and the Catholic Church are the same system as the Babylon which was mentioned by Apostle Paul in the first century and the author of Revelation. Most modern scholars have rejected the book's arguments as based on a flawed understanding of Babylonian religion, but variations of them are accepted accepted among some groups of Christian religious evangelical Protestants. Also referred to as the Dark Ages or the Rule of the Harlots, this was a period in the history of the papacy during the first two-thirds of the 10th century, following the chaos after the death of Formosus in 896, which then saw seven or eight papal elections. This story gets very complicated, but the main gist is that a girl named Marozia became the concubine of 45-year-old Pope Sergius III when she was 15 and then later took over other lovers and husbands. She ensured that her son John, who was rumored to have been fathered by Sergius III, was seated as Pope John XI. Marozia then arranged the murder of her former lover, Pope John X, through her husband, Guy of Tuscany, possibly to secure the elevation of her current favorite as Pope Leo VI. There is no record substantiating that Pope John X had definitely died before Leo VI was elected since John X was already imprisoned by Marozia and was out of the public view. The Alta Vendita conspiracy refers to supposed secret Masonic papers that detail plans to subvert the church by creating priests secretly favoring modern thought rooted in the French Revolution's Declaration of the Rights of Man. Author of the theory, John Venari, argues that Jews pushed the rationalistic beliefs of Masons, who supported notions of human equality and social progress, as a tool to serve Jewish interests. Venari keys in on the idea that Jews were finally given nominal equal rights early on in France's Third Republic, and because of this, the separation of church and state became a reality. Extra Ecclesium Nulla Salus means outside of the church there is no salvation. It is a phrase referring to a Christian doctrine about who is to receive salvation. The expression comes from the writings of Saint Cyprian of Carthage, a Christian bishop of the 3rd century. The phrase is an assumption often used as shorthand for the doctrine that the church is necessary for salvation. It is a dogma in the Catholic Church and Eastern Orthodox Church in reference to their own communions. It is also held by many historic Protestant churches. However, Protestants, Catholics, and Eastern Orthodox each have a unique understanding of what constitutes as the church. For some, the church is defined as all those who will be saved with no emphasis on the visible church. For others, the theological basis for the doctrine is founded on the belief that Jesus Christ personally established the one church, and that the church serves as a means by which the graces won by Christ are communicated to believers. 
St. Mary's Mother and Baby Home was a maternity home for unmarried mothers and their children. The home was run by a religious order of Catholic nuns that also operated the Grove Hospital in town. Unmarried pregnant women were sent to the home to give birth. In 2012, the health service executive raised concerns that up to a thousand children have been sent to the home for the purpose of illegal adoptions in the United States without their mother's consent. However, subsequent research discovered files relating to just 36 illegal foreign adoptions from the home. Separately, in 2012, a local historian named Catherine Corliss published an article documenting the history of the home before she uncovered the names of the children who died in the home the following year. In 2014, Anna Corrigan uncovered the inspection reports of the home, which noted that the most commonly recorded causes of death among the infants were infectious diseases and malnutrition. Corliss's research led her to conclude that almost all had been buried in an unmarked and unregistered site at the home, and the article claimed that there was a high death rate of the residents. Corliss estimated that nearly 800 children had died in the home. Joan of Arc is known as a famous French soldier, stating that she was acting under divine guidance. She became a military leader who transcended gender roles and gained recognition as a savior of France. She grew up as a peasant, later testifying that she was guided by visions from the Archangel Michael, Saint Margaret, and Saint Catherine to help him save France from the English domination. Essentially, after losing battle after battle, the court began to lose faith in her leadership. In response, she was put on trial by Bishop Pierre Couchon on accusations of heresy, which included blaspheming by wearing men's clothing, acting upon visions that were demonic, and refusing to submit her words and deeds to the judgment of the church. She was later declared guilty and burned at the stake on the 30th of May 1431. She was only 19 at the time. Some people deny that this ever happened, however. These include the theories that she was an Ill illegitimate royal child, and that she was not burned at the stake, that most of her story is a fabrication, and that she escaped death at the stake. These theories have not gained significant acceptance among academic historians, however. Every year on the 20th of January, the Roman Catholic Church commemorates the life and death of the early Christian martyr, Saint Sebastian. His story of religious defiance in the face of tyranny continues to resonate. The image of Saint Sebastian tied to a post or tree, his body riddled with protruding arrows, has since become an iconic image in art history, yet his image has transformed quite dramatically over the centuries. As a Christian, Sebastian was sentenced to death by an archer firing squad as a part of the last and most severe attack on Christians in the Roman Empire. The legacy of Saint Sebastian has continued throughout art history, particularly through sculpture and paintings that depict his moment of torture and eventual demise. Sebastian has often been depicted as emblematic of the pleasure and pain dichotomy within Christian martyrdom. That is, that one must endure pain on earth in order to receive the pleasure of eternal salvation. There is also a sense of longing in his gaze, whether this is for his future sanctification, the earthly life that is leaving behind, or both is unclear. The cross of St. Peter is an inverted Latin cross traditionally used as a Christian symbol, but in recent times also used as an anti-Christian and even a satanic symbol. The origin of the symbol comes from the belief that Peter the Apostle was crucified upside down. The tradition first appears in the martyrdom of Peter, a fragmented text found in, but possibly predating, the apocryphal Acts of Peter, which was written no later than 200 AD. It is believed that Peter requested this form of crucifixion as he felt that he was unworthy to be crucified in the same manner as Jesus. Today, the cross of St. Peter is also known as an occult symbol. It is suggested that the first person to use this symbol in this manner is Eugene Ventris, a 19th century leader known for his claim to be the reincarnation of the prophet of Elijah, as well as the demonic rituals and perverted acts for which he was condemned by the Pope tried and then imprisoned. Ventress wore robes bearing inverted crosses. 
Over time, the cross of St. Peter came to be known more commonly as an occult symbol, starting with the 1960s, several TV productions and movie franchises featured the cross of St. Peter as a symbol representing the Antichrist and Satan, making it one of the most popular satanic symbols today. The Holy Prepuce, or Holy Foreskin, is one of the several relics attributed to Jesus, a product of the circumcision of Jesus, to be specific. At various points in history, a number of churches in Europe have claimed to have possessed Jesus' foreskin, sometimes at the same time. Various miraculous powers have been ascribed to it. Joseph of Cupertino is most famous for levitating at prayer. Already as a child, Joseph showed a fondness for prayer. Following a brief assignment caring for a friary mule, Joseph began his studies for the priesthood. Though studies were very difficult for him, Joseph gained a great deal of knowledge from prayer. He was eventually ordained in 1628. Joseph's tendency to levitate during prayer was sometimes a cross. Some people came to see this much as they might have gone to see a circus sideshow. Joseph's gift led him to be humble, patient, and obedient, even though at times he was greatly tempted and felt forsaken by God. He fasted and wore iron chains for much of his life. The friars transferred Joseph several times for his own good and for the good of the rest of the community. He was reported to and investigated by the Inquisition. The examiners exonerated him. Joseph was canonized in 1767. In the investigation preceding the canonization, 70 incidents of levitation were recorded. This one translates to Hammer of Witches, which is much easier to pronounce. It is the best known treatment on witchcraft. It was written by the German Catholic clergyman Heinrich Kramer and first published in the German city of Speyer in 1486. It has been described as the compendium of literature and demonology of the 15th century. The top theologians of the Inquisition at the Faculty of Cologne condemned the book as recommending unethical and illegal procedures, as well as being inconsistent with Catholic doctrines on demonology. The Malaeus elevates sorcery to the criminal status of heresy and recommends that secular courts prosecute it as such. The Malaeus suggests torture to effectively obtain confessions and the death penalty as the only certain remedy against the evils of witchcraft. At the time of its publication, heretics were frequently sentenced to be burned alive at the stake, and the Malaeus encouraged the same treatment of witches. The book had a strong influence on culture for several centuries. The Cathar Crusade was a 20-year-long military campaign which Pope Innocent III initiated in order to eliminate Catharism in southern France. The crusade was primarily prosecuted by the French crown, and it promptly took on a political flavor. It not only resulted in a significant reduction of the number of practicing Cathars, it also resulted in a realignment of the county of Toulouse, bringing it into the sphere of the French crown and diminishing the distinct regional culture and high level of influence of the counts of Barcelona. Raphael Lemkin, who coined the word genocide in the 20th century, referred to the Cathar genocide as one of the most conclusive cases of genocide in religious history. Mark Gregory Pegg writes that the Cathar genocide ushered genocide into the West by linking divine salvation to mass murder and by making slaughter as loving as an act as his sacrifice on the cross. Chick tracks are short evangelical gospel tracks originally created by American publisher and religious cartoonist Jack Chick in the 1960s. Catholicism is a frequent target of Chick tracks and other writings. No fewer than 20 of the tracks are devoted to Catholicism, including Are Roman Catholics Christians? arguing that they're not, The Death Cookie, a polemic against the Catholic Eucharist, and Why is Mary Crying, arguing that Mary does not support the veneration Catholicism gives her. One notable tract entitled Mary's Kids focuses on an elderly Catholic member who disapproved of her son marrying a Pentecostal woman and teaching their young daughter about the Virgin Mary. The mother convinces the elder that Mary was not a perpetual virgin after confronting her about the fact that the Catholic priests were sex offenders. 
Martin Luther was a man who went to confession frequently in the monastery. He struggled with many spiritual issues, most especially the knowledge of his own salvation. Despite the strict monastic life filled with penances and prayer, Luther doubted whether he was truly justified in the eyes of God. Luther viewed the church as the whore of Babylon, and the pope himself as the Antichrist. A year later in 1521, Luther wrote another work titled On Monastic Vows, which led large numbers of monks and nuns to leave their monasteries and convents. Luther personally assisted the escape of 12 nuns from the convent. A few years later, he married one of them, named Catherine von Bora. Luther said that he rejected his priestly ordination and married in order to please his father and despite the Pope. These actions, as well as other acts of defiance, have led many people to hypothesize that Martin Luther was in fact demonically possessed. Prior to the 1930s, the main focus of devotion to Our Lady Fatima was on the need to pray the Rosary for the end of the World War I and for world peace in general. After the publication of Sister Lucia's memoirs starting in 1935, Fatima came to be seen as presenting the victory of the Blessed Virgin over communism. Containing words attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary, the text of the Third Secret released by the Vatican contains no words attributed to the Blessed Virgin Mary. The Third Secret supposedly begins with the words, In Portugal, the dogma of the faith will always be preserved words which Lucia included in her fourth memoir, but which are included only as a footnote to the text released by the Vatican. Lucia, however, stated in her fourth memoir that she was not going to reveal the third part. The third supposedly contains information about the apocalypse, apostasy, and satanic infiltration of the church. In an interview published in the 11th of November 1984 edition of Jesus Magazine, Cardinal Ratzinger was asked asked whether he had read the text of the Third Secret and why it has not been revealed. Ratzinger acknowledged that he had read the Third Secret and stated in a part that the Third Secret involves the importance of the end times and dangers threatening the faith and the life of the Christian and therefore the life of the world. The ties between Nagasaki and the Catholic Church go way back. A lord donated land to Jesuit missionaries from Portugal in 1580. The new religion spread so quickly that it was outlawed as a threat to local rulers. 26 martyrs were crucified in the city's hills in 1597. The only port continuously open to foreign trade, it was a stronghold of secret faith during the long suppression of Christianity from 1614 to 1873. The Fat Man, the plutonium implosion bomb detonated over Nagasaki, killed about 40,000 people immediately and another 30 to 40,000 by the end of the year. It decimated 71% of the Catholic community, many descendants of the hidden Christians who concealed faith behind Shinto and Buddhist practice. Blood libel or ritual murder libel is an anti-Semitic canard which falsely accuses Jews of murdering Christian boys in order to use their blood in the performance of religious rituals. Historically, echoing very old myths of secret cultic practices in many prehistoric societies, the claim as it is leveled against Jews was rarely attested to in antiquity. It was, however, frequently attached to early communities of Christians in the Roman Empire, re-emerging as a European Christian accusation against Jews in the medieval period. This libel, alongside those of well poisoning and host desecration, became a major theme of the persecution of Jews in Europe from that period to the present day. Blood libels typically claim that Jews require human blood for the baking of matzos, a flatbread which is eaten during Passover, although this element of the accusation was allegedly absent in the earliest blood libels in which then contemporary Jews were accused of reenacting the crucifixion. The accusations often assert that the blood of Christian children is especially coveted, and historically, blood libel claims have been made in order to account for the otherwise unexplained deaths of children. 
According to historian Walter Lacker, altogether there have been about 150 record cases of blood libel, not to mention the thousands of rumors, that resulted in the arrest and killing of Jews throughout history, most of them in the Middle Ages. In almost every case, Jews were murdered, sometimes by a mob, sometimes following torture and a trial. The term blood libel has also been used in reference to any unpleasant or damaging false accusation, and as a result, it has acquired a broader metaphoric meaning. However, the wider usage of the term remains controversial because Jewish groups often object to it. In the late June of 2017, Vatican police raided a drug-fueled gay sex party at an apartment belonging to an aide of one of Pope Francis's key advisors. The Holy Father was enraged since the home, inhabited by Francesco Cardinal, I'm not going to try and pronounce his last name. His secretary belonged to the Vatican's Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, the arm charged with tackling clerical sex abuse. Cops raided the apartment after the neighbors voiced concern about multiple people acting strangely while streaming in and out of the residence. Once police were inside the apartment, they said that they found multiple men engaged in rampant drug use and homosexual activity. They then arrested the priest, an aide to one of Pope Francis's key advisors, again, after taking him to a clinic to detox for the drugs he'd ingested. The unnamed aide went on a spiritual retreat shortly after in convent in Italy, the paper stated. There was a time when the bones of Christian martyrs provoked much value, and in the quest to acquire these sacred relics, an underground economy sprung up to match demand with supply. The market for relics spanned both high and low classes. Everyone from peasants to bishops to even kings clamored to see them. After all, these divine rock stars had the power to give direct blessings from God. On feast days, droves of pilgrims flocked to cathedrals and parishioners swooned and fainted, each one hoping to witness a miracle. The only problem was that acquiring top relics required a lot of time and money. It was a big business, and the most desirable relics were the ones that were the hardest to come by. The closer they were found to the Holy Land, the older and thus holier the relics were. Trips to Palestine were hardly a walk in the park, but Rome, the eternal city, with its cemeteries, ruins, and stature as the seat of Christianity, was the ultimate treasure trove. Certain popes, however, placed restrictions on the trade, largely because of the uproar of Roman citizens who were tired of foreigners looting through their cultural heritage. Despite the vast reduction of trade in unsanctioned relics throughout the centuries, the Catholic Church didn't stop requiring all altars to house relics until 1969. In 2011, the British Museum hosted the Treasures of Heaven exhibition, displaying some of the Vatican's costliest art and saints' body parts in all of their splendor. Vasula Ryden is an author, public speaker, and self-proclaimed Christian mystic living in Switzerland who says she receives messages from Jesus Christ and the Blessed Virgin Mary. Her writings frequently call for people to repent, love God, and unify the churches. She has developed a large following, particularly among Roman Catholics, who come to her lectures and buy her writings and tapes. She writes the messages in English and has changed some writings between editions. In 1995, the Catholic Church's Congregation for the Doctrine of Faith, led by Cardinal Joseph Ratzinger, published a notification, or a message from the Holy See, on the writings of Ryden saying that her communications should not be considered supernatural, and calling all Catholic bishops to prevent Ryden's ideas from being spread in their churches. In 2007, Cardinal William Levada confirmed that the 1995 notification was still in effect. He recommended that Catholics should not join prayer groups organized by Ryden. In 2011, the Greek Orthodox Church officially disapproved of Ryden's teachings, instructing their faithful to disassociate from Ryden. In 2012, the Church of Cyprus said that Ryden's teachings were founded upon heresy. Hans Schmidt was a German Catholic priest and rapist convicted of murder and executed in the United States at Sing Sing Prison in New York. 
He is the only Catholic priest in American history to face capital punishment. In Schmidt's most documented case, Schmidt met Anna Mueller, the housekeeper at the rectory of St. Boniface's church, who had immigrated from Austro-Hungarian Empire in 1910. In his conversations with alienists, Schmidt claimed to have heard the voice from God ordering him to love Anna. She first refused his advances, but eventually began having a secret sexual relationship with Schmidt. Beginning in December of 1912, Schmidt was also having a secret homosexual relationship with a New York City dentist named Ernest Moret, with whom he operated a counterfeiting ring. Schmidt later claimed to have enjoyed Moret more than Anna. Despite his subsequent transfer to St. Joseph's Church in Harlem, Schmidt and Anna continued a secret sexual relationship. It was later revealed that they were married in a secret ceremony, which Schmidt performed himself. Schmidt also wrote their names on a marriage certificate and told Anna that he was about to leave priesthood for her. During a sexual encounter with Anna on the high altar of St. Joseph's Church, Schmidt received what he claimed to have been a command from God to sacrifice Anna. The command was repeated so insistently that Schmidt told Anna, who called him crazy. Soon after, Anna informed him that she was pregnant. On the night of September 2nd, 1913, Schmidt went to the apartment that they had rented while posing as a married couple. He slashed Anna's throat while she slept, drank her blood, raped her as she bled to death, dismembered her body, and threw the pieces of her from the ferry into the Hudson River. Schmidt then returned to St. Joseph's Church, offered Mass, and administered Holy Communion as though nothing had ever happened. Gabriella Morth was an Italian Catholic priest and exorcist of the Diocese of Rome who performed tens of thousands of exorcisms over his 60 plus years as a priest. As the appointed exorcist for the Diocese of Rome, Amorth was the chief exorcist of the Vatican. In October of 2000, it was reported that he had performed over 50,000 exorcisms, which ranged from a few minutes to several hours in length. In March of 2010, he said that the number had increased by 70,000. By May of 2013, he said that he had performed 160,000 exorcisms in the course of his ministry. According to Amorth, each exorcism does not represent a victim of possession, but rather each exorcism is counted as a prayer or ritual alone, and some possession victims required hundreds of exorcisms. The Wandering Jew is a mythical immortal man whose legend began to spread in Europe in the 13th century. In the original legend, a Jew who taunted Jesus on the way to the crucifixion was then cursed to walk the earth until the second coming. The exact nature of the wanderer's indiscretion varies in different versions of the tale, as do aspects of his character. Sometimes he is said to be a shoemaker or a tradesman, while sometimes he is the doorman at the state of Pontius Pilate. Cecile Godfrey de Bombique was an Order of St. Joseph nun and Belgian serial killer who killed three people between 1976 and 1977. Bombique's aberrant behavior began after an operation to remove a brain tumor. Although the operation was outwardly a success, her colleagues noticed that strange behavior had started shortly after she had recovered from the surgery. When they later investigated her case, local police consulted neurological specialists who advised them that in some cases personalities can shift under such an operation. After her surgery, Bombique had been given morphine to ease her pain. Unfortunately, she became addicted and became fixated on obtaining money for illicit supplies of the drug. In addition, she made lesbian overtures to other nuns. After some time in this role, Bombique was officially accused of killing three patients due to allegations that each was too noisy at night. However, she was suspected of murdering more than 30 of that facility's elderly residents during a two-year span between 1976 and 1978. As well as the alleged homicides, she was also accused of stealing a large sum of money from her victims, as well as suspected repeated acts of torture, ripping catheters from patients, and other abusive behavior. Time magazine had reported that Bombique was finally apprehended through the efforts of fellow nuns who worked within the 38-bed geriatric ward and who recorded a string of mysterious deaths and other irregularities. Sister Lucy Truth began in 2017 as an effort to discover the truth concerning the life and person of Sister Lucia dos Santos of Fatima, specifically through scientific and expert analysis of various aspects of Sister Lucy. 
photographic evidence available on the internet in authoritative biographies as well as handwritten samples have been gathered and submitted for analysis in order to find out whether or not the real sister Lucia Fatima was replaced by an imposter during the year of 1958. Over the course of the years 2018 to 2022, Sister Lucy Truth commissioned a wide range of scientific professionals and medical specialists and has now compiled a sufficient number of expert reports to make the judgment that there were in fact two women. One authentic Sister Lucy, who was the seer at Fatima in 1917, and the other an imposter who presented herself as the real Sister Lucy of Fatima at least from May 13, 1967 until her death on February. February 13th, 2005. Lady of Akita is a Catholic title of the Blessed Virgin Mary associated with Marian apparitions reported in 1973 by Sister Agnes Katsuko Sasagwa in the remote area of Akita, Japan. The messages emphasize prayer, especially recitings of the Holy Rosary, and penance in combination with cryptic visions prophesizing sacerdotal persecution and heresy within the Catholic Church. A wooden statue representing the apparitions is venerated by faithful Japanese and other Catholics. In December of 1973, a Japanese television station videotaped tears coming from the statue's eyes. The apparitions were unusual in that the weeping statue of the Virgin Mary was brought broadcast on Japanese national television and gained further notice with the sudden healing of hearing impairment experienced by Sasagwa after the apparitions. The image also became affiliated with the Lady of All Nations movement, with which the messages share some similarities. Sister Faustina Kowalska kept a diary with her, and one of the entries details her experience of hell. It reads, I, Sister Faustina Kowalska, by the order of God, have visited the abysses of hell, so that I might tell souls about it and testify to its experience. The devils were full of hatred for me, but they had to obey me at the command of God. What I have written is but a pale shadow of the things I saw, but I noticed one thing, that most of the souls there are those who disbelieved that there is a hell. There are special tortures destined for particular souls. These are the torments of the senses. Each soul undergoes a terrible and indescribable sufferings related to the manner in which it has sinned. There are caverns and pits of torture where one form of agony differs from another. I would have died at the very sight of these tortures if the omnipotence of God had not supported me. Let the sinner know that he will be tortured throughout all eternity, in those senses which he made us of to sin. I am writing this at the command of God, so that no soul may find an excuse by saying that there is no hell, or that nobody has ever been there, and so no one can say what it was like, how terribly souls suffer there. Consequently, I pray even more fervently for the conversion of sinners. I insistently plead God's mercy upon them. O oh, my Jesus! I would rather be in agony until the end of the world amidst the greatest sufferings than offend you by the least of sin. On the 18th of January, 1277, Pope John XXI introduced Bishop Tempier to investigate the complaints of the theologians. Not only did Tempier investigate, but in only three weeks, on his own authority, he issued a condemnation of 219 propositions drawn from many sources, including, apparently, the works of Thomas Aquinas, some of whose ideas found their way onto the list. The list was published on the 7th of March, and it condemned a great number of errors, some of which emanated from the astrology and others from philosophy. These included that there was no first man, nor will there be a last. On the contrary, there always was and always will be generation of man from man. That God could not move the heavens with rectilinear motion, and the reason is that a vacuum would remain. That the world is eternal as to all the species contained in it, and that time is eternal as our motion, matter, agent, and recipient. And because the world is from the infinite power of God, it is impossible that there will be novelty in an effect without novelty in the cause. 
The penalty for anyone teaching or listening to the listed errors was excommunication, unless they turned themselves in to the bishop or the chancellor within seven days, in which the case the bishop would inflict proportionate penalties. The condemnation sought to stop the master of arts teacher from interpreting the works of Aristotle in ways that were contrary to the beliefs of the church. In addition to the 219 errors, the condemnation also covered unidentified treaties on geomancy, necromancy, witchcraft, and fortune-telling. Under St. Peter's is a short story by Harry Turtledove, first published in The Secret History of Vampires, edited by Daryl Schweitzer in 2007. It was reprinted in By Blood We Live, edited by John Joseph Adams from Nightshade Books in 2009, and We Install the Other Stories in 2015. Sure to become one of Turtle Dove's most controversial stories, Under St. Peter's tells how Jesus, rather than dying on the cross, instead became a vampire and was imprisoned in St. Peter's Basilica, guarded by the secret cadre of priests. The viewpoint narration alternates between the vampire Jesus, a somewhat deranged creature given to long periods of thirst, and the newly anointed Pope Benedict XVI, unnamed in the story but described unmistakably. Benedict is taken before Jesus shortly after becoming Pope in 2005 and is subject to Jesus' bite, a tradition stretching back to St. Peter. In the We Install collection, Turtledove says that this is his rare concession to secret history, a genre which he is unusually uninterested in writing. As of now, there is no settled doctrinal or moral practice with respect to ghosts or apparitions, says Lawrence Cunningham, Professor Emeritus of Theology at the University of Notre Dame. You can't point out a canon or canon law that addresses it. When it comes to the paranormal, the church walks a fine line. On the one hand, Catholicism is defined by a belief in the supernatural. One person of the Trinity was, in the not-too-distant past, commonly referred to as the Holy Ghost. But church leaders also must battle against errant belief in the occult. The word ghost comes from geist, the German word for spirit. A poltergeist, or a noisy ghost, is a spirit that makes its presence known with acts of mischief, throwing toasters or dining room chairs around. Martin Luther was one of the earliest to use the term poltergeister. The modern Catholic dictionary defines ghost as a disembodied spirit. Christianity believes that God may, and sometimes does, permit a departed soul to appear in some visible form to people on earth. The definition continues, their purpose may be to teach, warn, or request some favor for the living. The Catechism of the Catholic Church teaches that all forms of divination are to be rejected. This includes recourse to Satan or demons, conjuring up the dead, or other practices falsely supposed to unveil the future. The church has been contemplating and trying to explain ghostly manifestations for a long time. Much of that has been done through the uniquely Catholic concept of purgatory, where many ghosts reside. The church formulated the doctrine of purgatory at the councils of Florence and Trent in the 15th and 16th centuries. The catechism defines purgatory as the final purification of the elect, which is entirely different from the punishment of the damned. The following is a narrative from St. Vincent Ferrer. He relates that an archdeacon in Lyons gave up his charge and retreated into a desert place to do penance, and that he died the same day and the same hour as St. Bernard. After his death, he appeared to his bishop and said to him, No, Motzinger, that at the very hour I passed away, 33,000 people died. Out of this number, Bernard and myself went up to heaven without delay, three went to purgatory, and all of the others fell into hell. Our chronicles relate, however, an even more dreadful happening. One of our brothers, well known for his doctrine and holiness, was preaching in Germany. He represented the ugliness of the sin of the impurity so forceful that a woman fell dead of sorrow in front of everyone. Then, coming back to life, she said, When I was presented before the tribunal of God, 60,000 people arrived at the same time from all parts of the world. Out of that number, three were saved by going to purgatory, and all the rest were damned. <laughs>